Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. I'm Claire, a, libra- a librarian at the Greece Public Library. And today, my special guest is Mindy. She's been with us before. Mindy is our big historical expert, but we are going to have a really fun episode today. We are talking about romance, and I'm on the light and fluffy side. How about you, Mindy? What do you... You've got some good historical romance for us. Yeah, so my reading, I got into the Valentine's Day by with some good old-fashioned, historically accurate, somewhat um, love stories. Ooh. So, yes, quite spicy, quite racy. Uh-oh, okay. And mostly true. That's awesome. I'm looking yeah. forward to hearing about those. So, um, do you feel like your reading needs a jump start today? We are also going to talk a little bit about our Tend to Try which is our library challenge. So maybe one of the books we talk about today, you can like get out of your comfort zone or try a new genre. So keep that in mind. All the information is on our website. But um, yeah, so I'm going to get started with my first one, which was called Red String Theory by Lauren Kung Jessen. She also wrote a book called Lunar Love, and I would mm-hmm. classify this as chick lit light romance, also fairly clean romance, like mm-hmm. not real spicy. But um, the setup is Rooney is the daughter of a famous artist who is, and she's also an artist in her own right. But in order to break into the art world on her own, Rooney calls herself Red String Girl. And she does these public art installations, kind of like, you know, that guy that used to drape stuff and everything. I can't think of his name right now. But um, she uses red strings and Mm -hmm. does these installations. Um, So anyway, one night in New York City, she has done one of these installations and she meets by chance a young man who is an engineer for NASA. And they both end up at this copy store at the same time. Of course, their documents get switched, right? Mm -hmm. So um, It's quite meet-cute. Yes, definitely meet-cute. But then he also goes to a party that night. It's a Lunar New Year Eve celebration where they Mm -hmm. have to, like, they release uh, one of those balloons or lanterns for Mm -hmm. good luck during the year, and they decide to follow it. And, of course, they have a a wonderful night of dumplings and, you know, jazz clubs, and he's a musician. So, yeah, it's great. But then he goes back to California, gave her his number. Well, she put it in her phone wrong. So now they haven't met up, you know. So anyway, in order to try to get a promotion, he gets on this committee, and they are looking for art installations at NASA, and he thinks of that red string exhibit that he saw, and he reaches out to red string girl not knowing of course that it's the girl he met Mm -hmm. so um so of course it's a romance but it also had a lot of um like chinese kind of culture and history and her other book did too Mm -hmm. um so i i enjoyed that it was um also a big thing of like will fate bring us together like, are we meant to be, or is it just coincidences? So mm-hmm. Jack was much more realistic, you know, engineer, scientific mind, doesn't believe so much in fate. And Rooney, the artist, you know, is firmly entrenched that there is a fate, like there is that one person for you. So did she end up making something for an art installation for them? Yes, but I'm not going to go into too much oh, what she does, but they I'm do come back and now. meet again. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a very I quick read. I love that read. science and art connection there. Yes. It's wonderful when it overlaps like that. And also food. I I looked this author up, and she has a food and film blog called Dash wow. of Cinema, and there are some recipes in the book, like recipes from her family. Wow. And now that I think about it, I think there were recipes in the other book. Her first book was more about the Chinese Zodiac. Mm-hmm. And there was a person, a young woman that took over her grandmother or aunt's company. And she's trying to match you up, like, depending on what your sign is, like if you're a horse or a dragon or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, her love at the time, who they make a little cameo appearance in this book, was a young man that did the same thing, only he used an app. Like, it was much more uh-huh. technology-based. So that must be her thing. That makes me think of those experiences that you can go to the movie theater and you can eat the food in the movies. Yeah. As you, like, home alone, they'll feed you mac and cheese at different times. Oh, or yeah. The pizza. Yep. Yep. 
I don't know how expensive it is or if we have any access to that around here, but I always wanted to try something like that. Yeah, so it was fun. Um, I'd say if you like like light romance, mm -hmm. a little bit of maybe not magical realism, but something like that, mm -hmm. um, these would be good books for you. So Red String Theory by Lauren Kung Jessen. So. so Red String Theory sounds like an amazing read. Oh, thanks. So what's your first read, Mindy? So I'm going to follow mine in chronological order. Okay. So there are three nonfiction books about French and English royalty. And the overarching theme across all three of my books are sacrificing it all for love and passion and ambition. And, and there is some spice in there too. And it's all based on um, primary sources, diaries, letters, memoirs, newspaper articles, and it really chips away at that idyllic cover part of it and uncovers another kind of almost brutal and sad part of their story. So my first book is Love and Louis XIV, The Women and the Life of the Sun King by Antonia Frazier from 2006. And um, so Louis the the 14th was um, called the Sun King, and he ruled from when he was like five years old when his father, Louis the 13th, died. And he's also the one who's featured in Man in the Iron Mask. Oh, I love that. Isn't that? Oh, it's a great movie. Yes, it was. So instead of having a twin, his younger brother, um, he actually did have a younger brother, Philippe, uh, who's two years younger and never ascended the throne, but his line helped carry on French royalty. And I'll get into that in a minute. But Louis had four main mistresses. Wow, that must have been hard to keep track of. Not counting all the other... Um, Minor mistresses? <laughs> and his wife. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. So... And, and there were certain parts where, you know, he would have two mistresses running at once and his wife. And yeah, I just, the logistics of that, I wow. am just, I mean, in, it's incredible. Um, so his first mistress, Louise de Valliere, and I wish I spoke French because my accent is terrible, but I'm going to do my best here. So she was like the young love first flush. Um not counting his, his childhood crush, Marie de Mancini, who went on to marry an awful, awful person who she fled from later. But Louise had several children by Louis. None of them had children of their own, so their line did not continue. But um, Louise and Louis had very um, dramatic, tempestuous. Um, she was very guilt-ridden. You know, how could she commit adultery like this? And... Um, and how could she love a married man? And at one point, she got so angsty, she fled to a convent. And then there was this dramatic moment where he swirls a cloak around his face and gallops on his fastest horse to the convent to whisk her back to court. And all is forgiven. And then, um, and then when their romance um, kind of peters out, then um, she actually does go into a convent for the rest of her life and is known as Sister de la Misericorde and she was buried as a Carmelite nun. Oh, wow. Um, but she was superseded by his second mistress who was by far the most flamboyant one and Lucy Worsley does a fantastic documentary about Louis and his mistresses too. So I highly encourage anybody who's interested checking this out more. But Athenais, the Marquis de Montespan, had several children by her. She was very fertile, lots of kids. She had a, a husband who was not happy at being supplanted by the King of France. Um, she had one daughter or granddaughter who married Louis' brother's kid. And she was such a firecracker that Louis' brother's kid nicknamed her Madame Lucifer. <laughs> so I loved that. And the current claimant to the French throne is actually descended from Athenais and Louis the Fourteenth. So, so who was his wife? Was it Marie Antoinette? Nope, Maria Therese. So close. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, the Infanta of Spain. So um, Marie Therese's father and Louis's mother were brother and sister. Oh gosh. And they married a brother and sister. <laughs> oh. So oh dear. It was quite an it interesting says here, family line. Double first cousin. Yep. How would that work? So Louis's mother was the sibling of Maria Theresa's father. Oh my gosh. And then, <laughs> yes, and then L Marie Theresa's mother was a princess of France. I think her name was Elizabeth, and she was the sister of Louis the Thirteenth, I believe. So yeah, they had a, um, you know how everybody's family tree kind of like 
branches out and you get millions of generations and like 10 yeah that didn't happen with them so I'm and as a point of interest his line <laughs> his line with murray trace died out in the mid 1800s so it was not a genetically successful pairing um <laughs> no kidding so there was one kind of convent moment with Atenais where she had, she was famous for her temper. And um, when people would complain about it, Louis would say something like, don't you notice how her eyes flash when she, and they were like, she's crazy. Um, like, don't mess with her. They were afraid to walk in front of her windows at the chateau. They were afraid that of her comments that she would make. She wow. had a famous wit of the Montespan and, and um, she was really, really catty. So she, her, her grand moment was one time she, um, she threw a fit and stormed off and instead of running after her, Louis just gave the apartments at the palace to her son. And he was in such a hurry to move into his mother's apartments that he threw her furniture out the window <laughs> and she came back and she had to live in essentially what was the bathroom. Oh my God. So they changed the marble floor to like a parquet to make it warmer in the winter and, you know, and did the remodeling or whatever, but she lived um, she continued to live and have, um, not a mistress relationship, but more of like an emotional relationship with Louis. Um, and then the third one I'm going to talk about is, um, Angelique. So she had a boy who died young and, um, the records indicate that she had some traumatic events during the childbirth. So she was not able to have any more children and she died quite young of, um, some kind of pulmonary tuberculosis okay. or something. But this was, um, kind of like a midlife love for him. So she was about the same age as his son. He was in his 40s and she was like 18. Um, and it was said that um, he was embarrassed every time she opened her mouth to speak because I guess she was not the brightest and wittiest of the, of the lot, but she was beautiful. So that was Angelique. And then his last mistress, who they really think that he married her at the end in like a Morgan Attic ceremony, um, was Francois Madame de Maintenon, who's actually his children's governess. Oh, okay. So the kids he had with Atenais, she was the governess with them, and he would show up to visit his kids and see the, the beautiful idyllic picture of her with her kids on the lap, reading them a book, and he would just think, you know, how wonderful it would be to be part of that family picture. And they actually never had children together. She never had kids. She was married to a racy playwright who died. Um, he was much older than her, and he died of illness quite early in their marriage. And then she just looked to support herself by serving in different households. Wow. So she ended up marrying Louis to save his soul because they were um, there was a lot of tug back and forth with the Catholic Church with Louis living in sin and all that. So Madame de Maintenon married him, and um, but never admitted it. So when children or like young servants or somebody kind of innocently would ask, you know, aren't you his wife? She would say, who told you that? So she would never admit to it. But um, there, there are some scenes and, and some kind of hints that they dropped that. And one of the biggest indicators is that the Catholic Church did not give their relationship a hard time. So they think that, that the Catholic Church knew that there was a marriage going on there that they would admit to. I'm assuming his real wife had died by that time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, lived his real his his first wife by um, like 30 years, something like that. So, yeah, and um, and while they were all looking to see who the next queen of France was going to be, he was busy dividing up her the queen's apartments, and then people were like, "Oh, there's not going to be a queen. <laughs> oh my God. There's no apartments anymore." So, um, but Francois ended up. She was very modest. She didn't cost him a lot of money at all. She was not greedy. She wasn't um, interested in accumulating a lot of wealth. Um, so she pretty much so has what sounds like a closet room at Versailles. Um, and he was very, I would say, not very considerate of her needs. Like she suffered from rheumatism and he would insist on having the windows open all the time. She liked it quiet, and he would have his courtiers trooping through her space to talk to him about things. And he was just very... Um, I just, I would say he was polite, but just not really invested in making sure she was happy and comfortable. So she was a secret wife? Yes. Oh my gosh. But openly a companion. Interesting. So, yes. Like a situationship. Oh, I never heard of that. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. 
Yeah. It, do you, I don't know about you, Claire, but do you get like reality TV vibes from the whole Louis the... <laughs> uh, well, I was just thinking that this is crazier than fiction. Yeah. Isn't it? That's why I love nonfiction. Like, you can't would, make this up. Right. No, you can't make yeah. it up. And that would make a good mini series, I would think, on... So there's yes. Versailles, but it doesn't really do it justice. justice. No. No, how could you do that justice? I would love to be a historical consultant for one of these shows. <laughs> right? I would just be like, no, that's what this screenplay came up That's what screeners came up with. No, this is what really happened. Yeah. How about we try this? So, wow. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've said wow like 20 million times in this. <laughs> Good. Locked in. It's like, wow. Mission accomplished. That's yes. what I'm going for. Okay. Now everybody's so going to be after that book. And here I've got my light, you know. Mindless fluff. It's a good break. Break it up yeah. a little bit. How, so I, what's the over under on an Emily Henry book in your lineup today? No, I don't okay. have one. Right. I'm branching <laughs> out, Sean. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but yes, uh, these are definitely what I would call palate cleansers. Okay, so after nice. you read one of Mindy's, you know, in depth historical but very racy and unbelievable, you can read one of mine. But um. <laughs> Yeah, my next one is called The Second Chance Year by mm. Melissa Weisner. And this one, the quick summary, it's Sadie Thatcher is our main character, and her life has fallen apart in rather spectacular fashion. In one fell swoop, she's managed to lose her job, her mm. apartment, and her boyfriend, all thanks to her her propensity to open her mouth at the wrong time and say the wrong things. So. She goes to a kind of a swanky party where there's a fortune teller in New York City, and the fortune teller offers her one wish, and Sadie decides to do a redo of what she calls her terrible year. Mm -hmm. So deep down, she doesn't believe that magic will fix her life, but she makes this wish, and the, sure enough, the next morning, she wakes up, and she's back in her old apartment. She still has her old job, and she's right. still with that boyfriend. But, of course, you know what happens is she decides, you know, that really her life as it was, she was probably on a better path. So um, she learns her boyfriend and former boss are not everything she wanted them to be. And, and that's the one thing that I would say isn't light and fluffy in this because she is a pastry chef in New York City. Mm. And her boss is really, I would call him like sexually harassing her. Mm. He was a pretty awful dude. So, um, and she does have a friendship with one of her, her brother's friends. And that's where kind of her landing spot is in the terrible year. Like this guy's nice mm. enough to give her space in his apartment and everything. So she's got a lot to think about in, in this year of redo. And she mm. kind of comes to some new conclusions about her life and what she does with herself. So it is kind of inspirational, I guess. But um, how cool would it be, though, to have a second chance oh, like I that? Oh, I know. It yeah. kind of reminded me, you know, like Freaky Friday yes. vibes or... Um, there was another book by Rebecca Searle. It was called In Five Years. And then mm. there's another one called The Seven Year Slip where that woman meets somebody that's in the past. So mm. if you kind of like that time travel type of romance. It reminds me of that Richard Chamberlain, Jane Seymour movie. I can't remember what it was called, but. Not The Thorn Birds. No. Oh, oh, are you thinking the Christopher in... Reeve oh, movie? Oh, yes, that one, not Richard Yeah, Somewhere in Time. Yes, yes, that's the one. Oh, yes, that was a big old teal jerker yes. and made everybody want to go to Michigan to that Mackinac <laughs> Island. Yeah. But, um, oh, yeah. 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 But, um, so, yeah, that's the mm. only thing with the, the sexual harassment. And really, mm. she learns to speak up, but in a, in a better way mm. and advocate for herself. Um, and it does, of course, have a happy ending. So, yes, yeah, so a nice, light palate cleanser. <laughs> Little sherbet in between your main courses, yeah. if that's what Ooh, you're after. I love the idea of associating these books with food. Um, my next book is Ambition and Desire, The Dangerous Life of Joseph Josephine Bonaparte by Kate Williams. It was published in 2014. I have no idea what kind of food it would be, a croissant. I don't know. But um, So this is an area in history that I haven't explored a lot. So I was really, I took a lot of notes in there because I wanted to make sure I didn't slip up because there's a lot of people named the same 
the same names in these. Everybody's Marie something or other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, Josephine was born Marie, Joseph, Rose, Tasher, de la Pagere, and Martinique. Or she lived in Martinique when she was younger. And they called her Yayette. And then she married um, the son of her aunt's lover. Oh, Yes. These French are quite interesting. Fascinating. Yes. So the thought was if she married the son, then they, that the aunt would get taken care of because they had no children together and they, they were looking for some kind of insurance policy for when they got older. So, um, so they joined their two families together like that. Um, Alexander turned out to be not a very nice person. He was very, um, harsh with her and mean and she was in love with him so it was really really sad to read um but he would talk about how she had no sense of style and how she couldn't talk walk she was graceless and it's just a completely different side of empress josephine that i've ever read because she was like the epitome of grace and style and diplomacy so he was really hard on her and ended up um getting with um he had a mistress that he went to Martinique with, with his mistress, all the time writing to her saying, why don't you write me more? You're such a terrible wife. Meanwhile, he's off with his mistress. They had two <laughs> children together, Eugene and um, Hortense. And Alexander went on to be involved in the French Revolution. He got executed. He was president of I can't remember, I get mixed up with the stages of the revolution. But he was a political figure in the revolution, ended up being executed. Um, Josephine ended up in prison and she was almost going to be executed. Like they had even taken away her trestle bed and said, you're not going to need this anymore. <laughs> and then um, one day she was looking out the window and they saw a peasant woman making symbols, um, like touching her, her, her outfit and they're like robe. And then they figured out Robespierre had been executed oh, gotcha. and that's what saved her so she ended up being saved from the prison but while she was there they thought she was crazy because she would go around and say i'm going to overcome this i'm going to be the queen of france a fortune teller told her in her childhood on martinique or whatever that she was going to be greater than the queen of france so she did become greater than the queen of france she became the mistress of another political figure in the revolution um, Paul Barras, I think he was involved in the Thermidor part of the revolution. And Barras is the one who helped Napoleon rise to fame. And then Barras kind of handed off his mistress to Napoleon to get rid of her. And they got married. And th this book made it seem like it was so easy that Napoleon just conquered all this land and he just showed up and it, it just happened. So I don't know a lot about the military maneuvering part of it. But they really did focus on her relationship with him. He was very attached to Josephine's children. Eugene went around with, with him as like an aide de camp. And uh, Hortense married Louis, who is Napoleon's brother. And they had children together. Um, so did Napoleon have children with her? No. No. Okay. That's where it gets really sad. So they, the author speculates that um, Josephine was infertile after her spell in the temple or whatever prison she was in and she was also a bit older she was um in her 30s and 40s um so she never had any more children um napoleon convinced her to annul the marriage and he married the great niece of marie antoinette marie louise of austria and they had children which i mean they didn't end up you know he got overthrown, went in exile, came back, got exiled again. And Marie Louise um, went off and did her own thing. She did not stay loyal. But during the time when they were, Josephine and Napoleon were apart, she was just always, always worried about him and thinking about him. And um, I noticed some similarities between Napoleon and Louis XIV with how they treated their partners. Well, I think it was just a matter of custom and male privilege and all at that time i you mean really women were property through. essentially and she was treated just like that yeah so she was expected to dress up be all perfumed and gowned and just wait for napoleon to show up and and eat dinner with her yeah. and sometimes he wouldn't show up until 10 o'clock or midnight and she was just supposed to sit there like a statue and 
Um, and then when he would go to a party and just kind of blunder through and be all rough and ready and, and all that, she would like follow in his wake and like smooth all the ruffled feathers. And wasn't she, there a movie recently with Napoleon with Joaquin Phoenix? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I haven't seen it. I'll no, have to I haven't it seen out. it either. It's but Ridley I. Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that does sound good. So yeah, wow. um, yeah, so that they had a sad ending. Josephine, um, when they described her annulment, though, because he tried to get it so she would bring up the subject, because he was kind of afraid to do that with her. He saw her as his good luck charm. She may have been because after she left, everything split apart. And yeah, he, he didn't have too much luck after that, did he? He really didn't. He married his, his French princess or descendant of the Habsburgs, and yeah, and he lost everything. Yeah. So, um, but Hortense's son became Louis um, Napoleon III, who ruled France between the 1850s and 1870s. Wow. So okay. that was her, her line carried on in, in his memory. But yeah, sad, sad ending. Interesting. Wow. So here we go with some more fluff <laughs> after that sad, sad tale. And mine is called A Winter in New York by Josie Silver. And this main character, her name is Iris, and she decides to move to New York to restart her life. I believe she had an abusive boyfriend back in England. So her mom had a connection to New York City. Her mom was a, a performer and a musician in a band. So she decides that her fresh start is going to be in a city where her mom had so many happy memories. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that she and her mom did together, and of course her mom has since passed away. I believe she had cancer or something, but they had a secret gelato recipe that they shared and made together. Um, so now Iris is working in a restaurant. She has a good friend, and he takes her to a famous autumn street fair in Little Italy. And as they walk through the food stalls, a little family-run like gelato store catches her eye, and it, there's something familiar about it. And she realizes that she's seen the front of that store in one of her mother's old pictures oh, in wow. an album that she has. Mm. So... She's very curious, and she returns the next day, and she meets Gio, who tells her the shop is closing. His mm -hmm. uncle is the sole keeper of the family's gelato recipe, mm -hmm. and he's in a coma, so they can't make more. Mm -hmm. And when Iris samples the last batch, she realizes that her gelato and this gelato are one and the same. <laughs> so how can she tell them she knows her secret recipe when she's not sure why? Gio's uncle would have given it to her mother in the first place. So you have this little mystery of, of not huge consequence, but the mm -hmm. mystery of the gelato. Um, so she offers, of course, her services as a chef to help them recreate the flavor. And of, naturally, she finds herself falling for Gio. Um, but when Gio's uncle finally wakes up, all the secrets that Iris has been keeping threaten to ruin her new life, her mm -hmm. new love. So as usual in these romances, there's this lack of communication trope, which mm -hmm. drives me insane. <laughs> it's like if you would just talk to each other and tell the truth, you might have success here, mm -hmm. you know. But um, so there was no connection between the gelato recipe. Oh no, and there earlier. was definitely a connection. I can't tell you what it is because oh, that would spoil the you know. Okay, I'm going to have yes, to read it. But there's definitely a connection. Oh, that's um, fascinating. All I kept thinking yeah. is, dear God, please don't make it her brother. You know, <laughs> well, but it wasn't. I, it wasn't. That's where I thought it was going. I was like, well, yeah, that yeah. That may not be so light and fluffy, Claire. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. Yeah. We may have uh, the French aristocracy who is also like to uh, double cousins <laughs> yeah, marry their cousins. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, so if you like, like, Emily Stone or some of those, oh. and this one kind of had a holiday feel, even though it wasn't, you know, overwhelming, but it would make a nice Christmas story. Although, I personally, I don't know why people would eat gelato in, like, December or January, but apparently a lot of people do. So I love this connection with the food, though. Yes. So this book will be gelato. Yes. In the, in the course of the... And once again, a fast, easy yeah. read, so... 
So I guess that makes my book like the fruit and cheese platter after dessert or coffee. I don't know. Well, I think yours are more like the main course and mine are (laughs) the little like appetizers or little dessert nuggets or whatever. So So that segues nicely into my last book called That Woman, The Wife of Wallace Simpson, Duchess of Windsor by Anne Seba, published in 2011. And I'm going to... start talking about this book by describing the meal that she made when Edward VIII first dined at her house with her husband. Um, So she was married to a man named Ernest Simpson at the time when she got to know um, when he was Prince of Wales, and she had her cook make a traditional American meal of black bean soup, lobster thermidor, or fried Maryland crab cakes, fried chicken. Yes, because she was from Baltimore. Yes, she was from Baltimore. I thought of you, Claire, when I was reading this book. So it was fried chicken. I think there was lobster, some kind of seafood in there. And then the dessert was a cold raspberry souffle. And she judged the night a success when he asked for one of the recipes. So I thought that that was precious. So, but that woman is a book I've read before, but... It's kind of like one of those comforting, you go back to it, because you know the love story, and it's just um, it's just fascinating to read. But Anne Seba's take on it is based on a find of letters that she found. Somebody contacted her and just said, I found something interesting, you're going to want to see it. And um, I really need to do more research on where these letters came from, who found them, have they been authenticated? I sure hope so, because there's been a lot of historical research based on these since they were found a decade or so ago. But... You know, Wallace's story centers around, you know, he gave up his kingdom to marry her. Right. Edward VIII abdicated to marry the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. (laughs) It was too racy, too risky. You couldn't have a divorced woman, an American woman as Queen of England. Um, And then they went off and lived happily ever after. The letters that this author examines uncovers a completely different story. So my interpretation of it, how I read the book was Wallace Simpson was married to Ernest. They were kind of financially struggling during the Great Depression. She caught the king's, the prince's attention. And all of a sudden, you know, they were invited to parties and made all these business connections. And Ernest was welcomed into the prince's Masonic Lodge and made all those connections. She was given hundreds of thousands of dollars in jewelry. Oh, wow. Yeah, that they could later sell if they had to. And so all this was happening and Ernest went along with it. You know, yeah, this is good for both of us. And then Wallace Simpson expected like other previous relationships that he would get tired of her and drop her. And then she would just go back with her husband and that didn't happen. So there's letters between Wallace and Ernest saying, calling him Peter Pan, how he's never going to grow up, how this is not her plan and how she misses being with him. And they get divorced, and, and there was like talk about whether or not there was a collusion between them. And um, Ernest was found in bed at a hotel with a woman who was not his wife, and you know the hotel staff testified to that. And Ernest went on to marry Wallace's best friend from childhood, Mary Kirk, and they had a son together. And Mary died sadly of cancer shortly after she had her baby. So, but the letters, the correspondence between Ernest and, and Wallace, like they're making fun of Edward VIII and they're kind of um, degrading him and, and just criticizing him and saying how immature he is and how he'll never grow up and how, you know, wasn't life so much better before him. And it's just, it's not the happy fairy tale ending that, that was painted to believe. So, well, I don't, there's, there's been a lot about them because didn't they turn out to be Nazi sympathizers, if I'm not so mistaken? <laughs> they, they, it was covered in the book and, and um, in other books I've read about her too. So he, um, he was a German sympathizer, supposedly he did, he was fluent in German. They did go to Germany. Um, this author um, proposes that the only reason he wanted to go was so Wallace could experience what it was like to do a state visit. And Germany was the only country that was willing to give her that experience. So, um, but there are declassified documents, I believe, that indicate that Edward VIII was on their radar to be like a puppet king, if, if that came about. Um, 
I'm not 100% sure about the logistics of all this, but yeah, there is very, very famous photographs of her meeting Hitler and smiling and shaking his hand and all that. And Hitler, I'm looking at it right now. I'll put it in. <laughs> and Hitler saying, what a woman. And, you yeah. know, it's just, yes. And not only so, that, they met him at his mountaintop retreat. Yes. So that's like more than an invite. Yes, right. it was very, that's very a, personal yeah. very visit. That's not just a visit. Yeah, I'm looking state. at it right now. I'll put yeah. it in when we definitely. When I edit it, but it's wow. Hmm. Yes. Jeez. So both um, Wallace and Edward went on to write their memoirs in the 50s. So I haven't read either of them, but it's on my bucket list. Life's ambition. If I win the lottery, I want a first edition signed. Uh, one of her heart has its reasons goes for fifteen hundred dollars which isn't that bad but more than i would spend on a book fifteen hundred dollars for a first edition of her memoirs signed by her wow. signed by her yeah okay so if i win the lottery that's gonna be one of the first just another I... famous person from baltimore <laughs> <laughs> she put baltimore on the map that's she for did. sure her babe ruth there's a couple but not not many and there's also a napoleon connection too because there was a shipping magnet's daughter who married one of napoleon's brothers jerome oh my gosh and they ended up getting the marriage annulled because i think jerome was a minor or something or other and she was you know definitely not who napoleon wanted his brother to marry they were looking to marry into aristocracy and um she had a son and she went to live in exile on the continent for the rest of her life. I think her name was Elizabeth or Betsy. Wow. But yeah, she was from the Baltimore area too. <laughs> and they brought that up when um, when they were discussing Wallace's story in the newspapers at that time too. So Baltimore is not a good place. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just another one of those like wonderful fairy tale love stories that just wasn't all what it seemed. Well, really, about the only place you get this happy ending is in, like, these fictional fluff things, because it <laughs> seems like it doesn't happen too much in real life. No. Particularly the the wealthier you are. Like, look at Prince Charles and Princess Diana. I'm sure mm -hmm. it won't be long till there's books about that as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. interesting. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It says here that there was rumors at the time that Wallace was a German double agent, and... So this goes deep. This could be a, a topic all its own. There are special branch files yeah. on her. Her phone was tapped by the police. There's transcriptions of her conversations. Oh, my goodness. Um, she was good friends with Emerald Cunard, who was rumored to be the mistress yeah. of Leopold von Husch, I think is his name. So, yeah, they. she was definitely on the special branch's radar during this time for that reason. I might have to read about Wallace Warfield Simpson. Yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. a fascinating character. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Well, you m most definitely had some interesting <laughs> books to share with us today. Thank you for coming, Mindy. Wow. Yeah, it's always fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I like the the this or that choice that yes, we have today, too. Yes, I love the juxtaposition too. of the, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely the theme is love and romance and all that, but. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> do you want the real deal or do you want the light, fluffy, fake deal? I'll take the fluffy so one. So whatever you're yeah. in the mood for. Well, thank you for joining us for another edition of Book Break. And thanks, Mindy, for being my guest. We'll be doing a roundup later this month. Let us know, of course, if any of these books appeal to you and what you have been reading so far in 2024. And also, if there's any themes that you would like to hear us talk about, we are always open for suggestions. So leave us a comment on our Facebook or YouTube page or email us at greasepl dot podcast at gmail.com i'll have the address and all the books we talked about in our show notes so and i can um maybe in the show notes too we can put the link to the tend to try uh, yes. challenge in there too because we still got a few months on that story. yes yeah. you have until the end of march and i mm -hmm. think we're going to be talking about it a little bit more next time cool. but um yeah so we have some great prizes for the tend to try the the one basket we have has a Kindle Paperwhite. It's got a cozy reading blanket. Oh, I saw that Facebook post yes, about all the different one of, prizes. One of our reading mm -hmm. lights. Mm -hmm. and then we have like a reading themed basket. We have a bunch of Barnes & Noble gift cards. So by all means, it's not difficult and it would be fun. Definitely worth it. And really, what else are you going to do in Western New York <laughs> in the winter? <laughs> if you're not into skiing. Yeah. Yeah. Football. Yeah. yeah, football is over. We won't even go there. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.